In the last video, we reduced the selection from 13 different IDEs down to these last three for beginner-friendly IDEs with Jupyter Notebook functionality. Here, we're going to dive deeper into these last three containers. Let's start with JupyterLab Desktop. This is what it looks like when you start it. You get this launcher that lets you create new Jupyter Notebook files, IPython consoles, a new terminal that will also open here as a tab, which is useful if you need to install Conda packages, for example. You can open text files, markdown files, also Python files, and you can do all that from within JupyterLab. This is already more functionality than Jupyter Notebook has. Let's have a look at a lecture script on interpolation, comparing different interpolation schemes. If you now want to use the modplotlib widget feature, which on JupyterLab desktop worked out of the box, you simply mark the area of the plot. And if you're now interested in all the exact details, it even shows you the X and Y coordinates under the plot. Another feature that JupyterLab desktop has, if you are interested in this plot and you want to keep it open at all times, you can create a new view for cell output, and then you can drag it to the right, when you scroll in this notebook, this plot will always be open. This can be useful if you want to reference it later or you want to change it at different parts of the notebook. Let's open a new Jupyter file. And this one we can also drag over here and do our standard tests, A equals five, B equals three, print A plus B. And if we run that now, we see we get the right result. So everything is working. Another feature that is quite useful, if you want to create a copy of a notebook, but you don't want to copy everything, you just want to copy certain parts. Mark everything that you want by clicking on the first cell, hitting shift, and then marking everything with the arrow keys. And let's say we want everything up until the first plot. Mark everything, and then drag and drop it over here. That creates a copy of these cells that we can now also run. Let's say we wanted also this cell to be at the bottom, can simply scroll while we have it dragged and drop it here. Another feature, if you change something about the cell without running it, the marking turns orange instead of blue, meaning the output of that cell is not in line with the input of the cell. If you run it, it turns blue again. A feature that I'm gonna be using quite a bit is this right click new console for notebook feature. Let's make this a little bit larger so we have more space that you can basically use like a scrap paper for your notebook. So if you want to know again what A was, you can have all your print statements in this extra console, which is connected to this notebook here and only to this notebook, so that all the print statements that you use just for debugging purposes, where you see what is X, what is Y, is this stuff actually working? You can put all that stuff here. For example, X is an array from zero to 10, what is Y? Usually you would put all these print statements in here. And then later when you want to save your notebook, you need to remember to delete all that stuff because all these extra print statements actually make your code less readable because there's simply more code, more output, which makes it more difficult to find the relevant stuff. But if you can put all these print statements in a separate console here, then you keep your main working notebook clean while still having the option to print everything that you're interested in. And if you're done, you can simply close this again and have a clean workspace. I don't wanna make this video too long with going into all the features that JupyterLab has. All I wanna show you here is how to work with environments. If you click in the top right, it shows you which environment is currently active. If you want to switch environments for this notebook, you simply click on another environment and it will restart the session with that other environment active. In Jupyter Notebook, that would have taken a lot longer because you start a new Jupyter Notebook server, open the file again and run everything again. Whereas here, you simply click on it, it will restart and run it. If you want to add new packages and environments, click on this gear icon here. This will open this environments page here and you will see all your environments that are currently there. You can create new ones. However, I do not like this feature that much because you cannot install from a YAML file. If you don't know what that is, it's basically one file where you specify all the different packages that you want to install. Here you would have to enter them manually. So you'd have to say, I want NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, so on and so forth. I did not see a way here to do it from a YAML file. But what you can do is go back to the launcher, open a terminal and install the Conda environment here from a YAML file. This will always work. Once you've done that, if you go back to the settings, you will either see them here or should they not pop up, which in my case, they always did. So all the environments that you install with Conda should be visible here. But if not, you can click add existing, navigate to the folder where the environment is installed in, and then it will also be available here. The only thing that you then need to do is define your default environment. There is no way to say make this default, but you can copy simply the Python path. And in your settings, 
put that in here. This is the path to your standard environment, so the one that is loaded by default. So you simply put that path in here, and then this will be your default environment. In summary, JupyterLab is a worthy successor of Jupyter Notebook because it's both easier to use and has more features than Jupyter Notebook did. Let's have a look at Anaconda Cloud next because it's basically the online version of JupyterLab. It looks and feels very similar to JupyterLab. You start here with a launcher. You have documentation up here. When you start a new notebook, it even asks you which environment you want to run it in. So it comes with a bunch of environments pre-installed. You also have the option here to start a console, a terminal, text file, same as before. Yeah. When you open a new file, this is what it looks like, same as before. So first of all, our standard test, it always works both in the environment that I later installed. So this is my environment here, the Conda Lab Python course environment, but you can also choose here which environment you run it in. So all the other environments here are provided by Anaconda Cloud and they are pre-installed. However, you don't really know which packages are in here until you activate them and then run a Conda list command. And should something be missing, so for example, this I try to run in one of their environments, it runs and runs and runs until at the end it tells you environment not writable error. The current user does not have have permission to the target environment, meaning you have to take the environments that are pre-installed the way they are or install your own one. However, as you can see up here with the disk usage, I just installed one environment and I'm already using 80% of the five gigabyte of storage space that they give you, which is enough for one environment. But given that the environment file is not even that large, if you need more packages, you might run out of storage quite quickly here in the online version. Then again, this is free, so you can't really complain. The Vega datasets work with our environment. They don't work with theirs, so it was not part of their environments. And now what they actually have here is the built-in Anaconda assistant. I did not have to install anything. This worked right out of the box, which is an AI assistant for programming. It gives you some examples. Plot the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. You get the function definition, you get the plotting commands, and you get a plot. You could talk more with it now if you wanted to change the colors or change something about the plot. Another thing that it can do is if you mark the code here, it automatically pops up and you have the options here to explain the selected code, to add comments to the selected code or refactor the selected code. This is how I want beginners to use AI. Think of how in school you started using a calculator. You needed to learn basic arithmetic first before you could automate it with a calculator. This is also how you should use AI. I know there are a lot of people out there who say now anyone can be a programmer because all you need to do is type in what you want in plain text into an AI tool and then it will give you the code. However, only in 90% of the cases does the code actually work. So you still need to know what is going on in order to fix it then. And oftentimes you don't get exactly what you want. So then you need to reprompt it and make manual modifications on the code. And if you've never learned how to do anything by yourself, programming wise and only rely on AIs, you will quickly run into problems that you simply cannot fix. But to use AI to explain code to you. So for example, you get code from someone else and you don't understand anything and have an assistant like this explain it to you, that is very useful even for your own code. If you don't understand your own code anymore after six months, ask an Akana assistant, explain it to me, and you will get a simple explanation. Another thing that I like about the Anaconda Assistant that is very contrary to anything Microsoft or Google would offer you, if you go in the settings, first of all, your account is free, which is nice. Of course, you have limits here, but data collection and usage is by default not enabled, meaning they're not collecting your data, they're not using your code to train some AI models. You can just use it without paying for it with money or with your data. You can upgrade if you need higher limits. So for example, here you have 30 responses per day. And what I also saw later is that this Anaconda Assistant also works in JupyterLab desktop. So you can install this Anaconda Assistant also for desktop. However, there you're restricted to 30 responses in total in the free version. But as soon as you go for one of the paid versions, it works exactly the same as online. I think in the first tier, you have 60 responses per day offline and online. I don't want to dive too deep into the AI topic because we're going to make a separate video on that. All I want to say here, it works out of the box, it doesn't collect your data, and it's free. Last thing I want to show you here is that the Matplotlib widgets, so the zooming feature for your plots, did not work out of the box. Um, I saw some way to fix it, which was this, but even with that, it didn't work. 
you get some JavaScript error, which if you read further into it, is some incompatibility in the environment. So there's a good chance that if you just reinstall the environment with different version numbers, then it'll work. But I didn't want to spend too much time on it here. In case you're wondering if the useful features that worked offline are also working online, the answer is yes. So when you right click on this plot, you can create a new view for cell output. You can move it to the right and then scroll here while always having this open. And what you can also do is open new console for notebook and then for example, print A and you get the cell output without cluttering your original notebook. So if you close that here again, it's gone. Quick break for a word from our sponsor, me. If you want to know more about using Python for scientific and engineering applications, check out trainingscientists.com where I offer courses that you can take either as an on-demand course or a blended learning course. If you want to know the difference, check out this video where I explain it in detail and show you what the user area looks like. Back to the video. Last, let's look at Microsoft's VS Code, which is also platform independent, so it works on Windows, Mac OS, and even on Linux. And it's also relatively beginner friendly and has a lot of AI integration features with Copilot that we're gonna look at in one of the next videos. It also features that you can open files by double clicking them. So if you open them with VS Code, this is what it looks like. When you then first execute a cell, it will ask you which environment you want to run it in. Click on Python environments, then for example, our JupyterLab Python course environment, then you can execute all these cells. However, if you do make some changes here and look at the files in the same folder, it will not open the folder automatically. So you need to click on open folder and open this folder that this file is in. And then it will ask you to save the file, although you might want to keep it open. So you save it and then you need to open it again. It's not that convenient, but also not that big of a problem, but something to keep in mind. One thing I want to show you here, let's have a look at the same plot that we looked at in Jupyter Lab with Matplotlib widget that worked here out of the box. So you can click on the zooming feature, mark this area and zoom in and out. And it's also very fast because it's running on your computer. This didn't require any additional installation other than what is installed with the environment file. One thing that you saw me do in Jupyter Lab that also works here is that you can have these marker lines. So this ruler and editor, it was called in Jupyter Notebook so that you know when to do a line break. It's not that user friendly to configure because in the settings, you're basically just editing a JSON file. But if you can get past that, it's relatively easy. A unique feature that only VS Code has is to have hybrid Python files where you can also run parts of the code as individual cells. When you click here on run cell, you get the output here on the right. However, when you run this for the first time, it asks you to install something. And if you then run the cell that has a couple of import statements, it will say that the NumPy module is not installed. So then it basically creates a new environment where you then need to install everything. This is a very useful feature because I always develop first in Jupyter Notebook. If I need that file on a supercomputer, for example, I need to export it as a Python file because on a supercomputer, you cannot run Jupyter Notebooks. You don't have any graphical user interface, so you need the Python scripts. Generally, you would just export your Jupyter Notebook file as a Python file and then run it on the server. However, if you then need to make changes, sometimes I just need to change one line of code, for example, on the server because something wasn't working, then I don't have the changes locally. And then I have two versions of the file, one as a Jupyter Notebook, one as a Python file. And here you can have one version of the file because if you want to run this as a script, it still runs top to bottom because this hashtag percentage percentage is a comment that VS Code knows to interpret as a cell. But as a Python script, if you simply run it, it will be ignored. Then it runs top to bottom. In general, I don't find VS Code as intuitive as Jupyter Lab, but that might just be because I've been using Jupyter Notebook for the past 10 years. But for example, here you have this command palette and you can look for all kinds of stuff by hitting the arrow key and then for example, terminal. As always here, you don't just get one option. So Python create terminal is the one that we would want to use if we wanted to install another environment, but you also get a bunch of other options that have nothing to do with Python development because VS code can also be used for JavaScript development or all kinds of other programming languages, which is of course useful because once you get used to it, you only have to use VS code basically, and you can use it for all kinds of languages. But if you're only using Python, you have a bunch of features here that you simply don't need and that clutter up the user interface. You can have a terminal here. You see you're in the base environment. You can run your conda installation commands down here. You also have something quite useful when you click to Jupyter, the variable explorer, kind of like in spider, or if you use the variable explorer also in Jupyter lab, you have an overview over your 
your variables and also for data frames if you're using pandas, which is quite nice because now you can double click arrays, for example, and have a closer look. This data viewer opens, then you have this overview here. Let me close some things to get more space. And then you see all that is inside of your array. One feature that VS Code also has is the table of content. So you have your table of content here and you can jump to the different sections in your notebook. However, I like the view of the table of contents better in Jupyter Lab. And another feature that VS Code doesn't have is where we can right click on a plot and keep it in view at all times or to have a scrap notebook open here for all our debugging purposes. This is stuff that doesn't work here. It has a lot of functionality and in one of the next videos when we look at more advanced features, we're going to come back to VS Code. At this point, I would say it's a matter of taste. If you have used VS Code before and you're used to it and you like it, then I'd say use VS Code for Jupyter development. However, if you've never used anything else before, I would start with Jupyter Lab, either as a desktop version on your computer or the Anaconda Cloud version in the cloud. In the near future, we're going to make another video on AI assistants and compare them in terms of price, functionality, and also privacy. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified when that comes out.